Now, there's a little problem with the massacre of the infants, though. Um, the only account of the massacre of the infants that we possess is in the Gospel of Matthew. So some skeptical scholars have said, well, ah, how do we know that really happened, right? I mean, it's a pretty momentous event, right? Um, is that true, historically? Well, it's fascinating because if you start digging into the figure of King Herod, who, by the way, Josephus calls King Herod the Great, not because he was a great guy, but because he was the first of many Herods. He named not all of his sons, but many of his sons Herod. Okay? So there are all these different Herods running around. He's kind of like George Foreman. You ever seen he had George Foreman? I think he has like four or five sons. They're all named George. Okay? So, you know, very humble guy, right? And Herod was the same way. So Herod the Great, if I say that, I'm not complimenting him. It's just what he's known as in scholarship. Well, if you look at King Herod the Great, um, and you ask, was he the kind of person who might massacre a whole village of children just to protect his throne? The answer is yes, yes, absolutely yes. Let me give you a few examples from history. And here I'm going to be drawing on uh, another historian, not Eusebius, who's a Christian historian, but Josephus. He was a first century Jewish historian. He was a priest in the temple. He was alive at the time of the destruction of the temple. And he gave us a massive history of the Jewish people. It's one of our most important resources about first century Judaism. So you'll often hear me quote Josephus as a very, very valuable source. And Josephus tells us everything about Herod uh, and, his, and his family. And he makes very clear that Herod was precisely the kind of king who could do what was told to us about the massacre of the infants in Matthew's gospel. For example, King Herod uh, executed his own wife, Mary Omne, whom he loved dearly because she, he thought she was undermining his claim to the throne. So here's, a, here's some quote from Josephus. He says, The love which Herod felt for Mary Omne, his wife, was not less intense than those justly celebrated in stories. Wow. It's like Anthony and Cleopatra, you know, Romeo and Juliet. That was what Herod and Mary Omne were like in the local Jewish tabloids in Jerusalem, okay? Their love was famous. And yet, however, she openly jeered at both his mother and sister for their low birth, because they were Idumeans, and reviled them, so that suspicion was thereby nourished in Herod's mind. So calling together those who were closest to him, he brought an elaborately framed accusation against her and finally condemned her to death. So he had his own wife executed because he thought she was undermining his claim to the throne. And then he went, basically went mad after her death because he, he, he loved her and he longed for her, but he couldn't have her back anymore because he killed her. Well, he should have thought about that first, uh, Herod. Okay. That was in 29 BC. So you think Joseph would have known about that? Yeah. Yeah, he'd have heard about that. Right? Get a little closer to Jesus' birth. Around 7 BC, Herod had his own sons executed because he thought they were undermining his claim to the throne. Again, Josephus writes, quote, When Herod read aloud the letters that had been written by his sons, there was no plot or any notion of filial disloyalty mentioned in them. Only some offensive remarks about Herod. They didn't like their dad very much. And when he came to Caesarea, everyone at once began to talk about his sons. And the kingdom was in suspense as people waited to see what would be done with them. All right, pause here. Remember what Matthew told us happened in Jerusalem when they started hearing rumor about the child being born? It wasn't just Herod who was nervous. Who was nervous? The whole city, because they knew what Herod could do. He killed his own wife. So word gets out that he's having conflict with his sons, and everybody starts to wonder, oh gosh, what's going to happen now? Sure enough, it says Alexander and Aristobulus, his two sons, were taken to Sebastian and at the command of their own father were killed by strangling. So he had his own son strangled to death to protect his throne. But it gets better, at the, or worse. At the end of his life, right before he died, one of the last things Herod did was to order massacres and executions of one more of his sons, but watch this. This is even, this is, it's unbelievable. So Herod basically gets really sick. He's dying. And this is what Matthew talks about when he says the death of Herod. This is, this was a very dramatic thing. It was very public because he began to get very, very sick. He had, uh, he had gangrene. He had all kinds of uh, ailments, stomach ailments, intestinal problems. It was really bad and gross. And, and he sought all kinds of healings, but nothing worked. And people began to get excited that he was going to die. And he didn't like that. So it says, quote, Herod was not blind to the feelings of the Jews, 
and he knew how ardently they prayed for his death. Yet he would, he said, have a grand funeral, such as no other king had ever had. So when he was about to leave this world, Herod took care to leave the entire nation in a state of mourning over the loss of their dearest ones. And he gave orders to do away with one member of each household. Although they had done nothing wrong or offended him in any way and had not been accused of any other crime. Why? In another place in Josephus, he says, and Harry tells us, so that there would be real mourning at my funeral. So he said, well, if you're not going to mourn for me of your own will, I'll kill one member of every family so that there'll be wailing and lamentation throughout the whole nation. Now, after he died, that order wasn't carried out, but he still ordered it. So you think that's the kind of guy who would care about killing some little boys in the tiny village of Bethlehem? He wouldn't even blink an eye. I mean, this man was evil. He was diabolical, right? He really is an antichrist, an antichristos, who tried to pretend he was the Christ. It's one of the reasons he built up the temple. We'll look at that a little bit later, too. Herod was making the temple massive with all the money he had because he knew, the Jews knew, that when the Messiah would come, he would build a temple. And so Herod said, I'll show you. I'll show you a temple. And he made the temple complex one of the wonders of the ancient world, just to prove that he was the true king. Unfortunately, his order, or fortunately, his order was not carried out. And then Josephus picks up and says again, having done this, he died. And on the fifth day after having his son Antipater killed. So his son Antipater, or Antipater, you can pronounce it either way, he killed, he had him executed five days before he died. That was his last act. He had reigned for 34 years. And he was a man who was cruel to all alike and to one who easily gave in to anger and was contemptuous of justice. So, I mean, you couldn't ask for more historical evidence to support the portrait of Herod that we see in the Gospel of Matthew. Guys, these are, this is real history we're looking at when we're thinking about the life of Joseph. These aren't just stories. Joseph is immersed in the life of his people. He would have known Herod executed his own wife. He would have known Herod executed his own sons. And so when the angel came to him and said, get up, go to Egypt, because Herod seeks the life of your boy, what did Joseph do? He didn't wait. He didn't blink an eye. I'm not worried about the robbers they might have on the highway. I've got a king right down the road who's a murderer who wants the Christ dead. 